Welcome to Top 5, a show where we count things down from number 5 to all the way to number 1. And this week on the show, we are returning to an old favorite, Top 5 Comedies. Top 5 Comedies. We've done this one before a year or two ago, I think. But uh, people enjoy it when we revisit. They can compare what we did before, see what new things have added, been added into it. Or uh, just say, hey, is this a repeat show? And then turn it off and go and do something else. But we hope you don't do that. And uh, so this week we're going to be looking at top five comedies. Comedies. Got a little something in my throat. Matthew, what do you have for your number five? I didn't realize we had done this before. So this is probably the exact same list. But my number five is a movie from 2001. A movie that Otter Disaster actually introduced me to. And... I have to say it has grown on me. The first time I saw it, I was like, eh. And the second time I saw it, I was like, okay, there's some amusement here. And about the fourth or fifth time that I saw Super Troopers, uh, the story of five Vermont cops, uh, actually highway patrol officers, who try to get past the fact that they're Vermont highway patrol officers by filling their boring days with uh, shenanigans, and don't pistol whip me. I really felt like it kind of hit a groove. Um, And it's the work of a comedy troupe called Broken Lizard. And Broken Lizard is interesting because it seems like every decade, there's like a five man group of people who changed the world of comedy, at least for me, because you got your Monty Python, you got your kids in the hall, uh, you got your Ronald Reagan administration. So you go through there and eventually you get to uh, Broken Lizard. I think they've actually been supplanted, but uh, I'm old and so I don't learn new things anymore. But Super Troopers is not just quotable, not just funny. It's weirdly relatable. There's a scene halfway through the movie where um, one of them is talking about how, talking to his wife or his girlfriend about how if he loses his job, they're going to have to break up or move. And it's a completely straightforward discussion, a relationship discussion that anyone would have. Uh, But for some reason, he's carrying a a bunch of bananas in one arm and some towels under the other. And the reason for those items is just this hilarious ending moment for that sequence. And then you finally do get to the end of the movie, and it has not just one of the great downer endings of all time, followed by an amazing swerve. It's really, really funny. And I think that the way I understand it, probably 40% of the movie uh, has been semi-improvised, which I really appreciate. And it introduced me to the talents of Brian Cox, who I didn't realize is a genius and was in everything and was actually the first man to play Hannibal Lecter. So if you ever want to see Hannibal Lecter as the boss of five goofballs, Uh, who sort of run around and do things, definitely check out Super Troopers. That description does not do it justice. It's a very, very funny film. All right. My number five is going to be very, very controversial because the person who made this is not a good person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bad. He's a bad, bad person. In fact, he's in jail for being a bad person. Whoa. But when we talk about separating the art from the artist, And we just look at the art of what this person did. I think you could say that to to, uh, my brother, Russell, whom I slept with, is a fine bit of storytelling and comedy. And I know that that is somewhat controversial considering the person who recorded that album. But for about a decade, that was my go-to comedy album. Just because it is literally... Side one of the album is all about how he, when he was younger, he and his brother had to sleep in the same bed and it was a converted baby bed uh, with the sides taken down and they had to sleep in there and they can't sleep and they get into shenanigans and they're keeping their dad awake at night and they're getting into all sorts of trouble. And the dad, you know, keeps storming in and promising he's going to whip all the, the, the skin off their hide. It is one of the funniest things that this person has ever done. And if you ever want to, separate the art from the artist and go and listen to the album to my brother, Russell, whom I slept with. It is worth it. That being said, I haven't listened to the album since the allegations came out. And since the person went to jail, 
uh, just on on my own. But I feel comfortable talking about the album because it is a brilliant piece of storytelling uh, in its own right. So, uh, you know, take it for what it's worth. That's my number five. It is uh, my top five audio to my brother Russell, whom I slept with. Uh, Rodrigo, what do you have for your number five? My number five is a TV show, a mm-hmm. situation comedy, if you will. Oh. Um, it's called Happy Endings. Mm. I talked about Happy Endings before. It's, to me, the ultimate culmination of the uh, Friends formula, where a lot of things go like, you know, uh, it's always sunny is sort of like, what if friends but they're seinfeld caliber sociopaths right Mm -hmm. um happy ending says what if friends but it was actually funny (laughs) (laughs) i never like friends that much yeah Uh, yeah no so it's if uh if you like just sort of like good tight sitcom writing um, I strongly recommend Happy Endings, and I strongly recommend you check it out now because, as I've come to find out, comedy has an expiration date. Yeah. <laughs> See my number five. Um, yeah. For one reason or another, if nothing is, if nothing else is that, like the references fall off. You know, it's like if you're, mm-hmm. if you're like young, a younger person coming in, you have to like look up who these people are talking about to to get the jokes. Uh, but Happy Endings is really good. It's a good combination of people. Um, it has um, Damon Wayans Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has um, the that girl that was on Saturday Night Live for a couple seasons. Uh, mm-hmm. It has um, that girl that did some sexy movies at the beginning of her s- stuff, but is actually a pretty good actress, and then did Happy Endings. Uh, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the problem um, problem is I'm trying to look up happy endings on the web just by typing in happy endings. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, give you the answers yeah. that you think that you're going to get on this. Right. And uh, uh, happy ending streaming also doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. It's it's Casey Wilson, who is yeah. the girl who was on Saturday Night Live, and then Eliza Coop, who had been on um, uh, Scrubs, the last couple of seasons of Scrubs right before this. Yep. Um, and actu- And Eliza, there's another Eliza in it. Um, uh, Alicia Cuthbert, who yeah. I think was from 24. Yeah. So she's been, uh, all of those guys were in stuff and have been in stuff since then. Um, it's got, uh, great jokes. Like there's, uh, a, an episode all about the butterfly effect, but it's mm-hmm. called the butterfly effect effect mm-hmm. because <laughs> it's about the, the running gags about how, uh, things that you do affect other people and affect the future, just like that movie Ashton Kutcher did um, <laughs> affected his career for so long, right? So it's the butterfly effect effect. Um, the banter between characters is great. Like, I was completely sold on this show. There's a wedding in season, either season end of season one or season two. And they're trying to figure out if somebody actually poisoned one of the members of the wedding party um and the back and forth is just absolutely hilarious sometimes i go and i just play that scene just to uh just to see the the just excellent comedic timing so if you get a chance to check out happy endings i'll i'll do the searching for you it's on hulu right now oh okay good um i would strongly recommend you check it out okay all right, there you go. There's our there's our first entries into our number five comedies, ladies and gentlemen. And I think we've already mm-hmm. struck gold. Can we get to uh, platinum or uh, 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 humor humorousium by the end of the show? Let's find out with our number fours. Matthew, what do you have for your number four? I I, I I'm afraid of the phrase humorousium. My number four. I was a little more literal, I think, than you guys, because when I read comedies, I'm thinking, oh, okay, films. So I have five movies. My number four movie is actually a movie as old as I am, actually a little bit older, because it came out in January of the year that I was born. And it spawned a very long-running television series 
which is absolutely nothing like the movie MASH. Mm. Uh, if you've ever seen MASH, MASH is just one of the most Robert Altman films that ever did Robert Altman. The only one I can think of that's more Robert Altman is maybe Brewster McCloud, but it's based on a novel and the writer of the novel hated the movie. Uh, the screenwriter of the movie hated the novel and Robert Altman apparently just hated everybody, but it's the story, as you know, of surgeons at a mobile army surgical hospital during the Korean conflict and the general characters from the first three seasons of MASH are here. In some cases, characters who bear those names and little else are here. But uh, the main story ends up being about Hawkeye, who is uh, a cardiologist, and an old sort of kind of colleague of his, a man named Trapper John, who shows up about 20 minutes into the film. And it's important to note that 20 minutes into the film, Trapper shows up because about five minutes before that, you actually hear him in a scene because Altman actually cut this movie together after apparently shooting hours and hours and hours of footage. So there are a couple of moments that seem to appear out of order that don't make sense. And somehow it's still really funny. It's the only thing I think I've ever found Rod Robert Duvall funny in. Um, I don't know if Robert Duvall has ever done anything else that was supposed to be funny, but it's got really, really talented actors, uh, including Renee Bergenois, who grew up to be Odo from Star Trek Deep Space Nine and is like 12 in this. But if you watch MASH, you have to remember two things. First of all, it came out in 1970, but it was still the 60s. Second of all, Gary Berghoff does not age. So he is the same man in 1970 that he is in 1982. And third and most important, the funniest character in the whole movie is a man named Sergeant Gorman, played by Bobby Troop from Emergency, who has the just one line, but says it about four times. And that line is, <laughs> so if you get through the film, just counting the times that you see Bobby Troop come through and say, I feel like you'll enjoy MASH the way I do. I don't know if it's aged well. I think that much like, you know, Stevens number five, there are moments that have gone, in retrospect, have gone past their expiration date. But I still enjoy it. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a pretty progressive, you know, liberal kind of, this is horribly offensive, and yet I still laughed kind of guy. So... Uh, take that caveat. My number four, MASH, the movie, not the television series. Uh, my number four is a web recommendation from Rodrigo from, gosh, probably when we first met. And it is a web cartoon uh, about a special kind of kid or adult and his uh, his magical group of friends, including Strong Bad and... Uh, you know, his girlfriend and that other guy and Teen Girl Squad. Uh, I'm talking about Homestar Runner. You've never had the joy. Here's the problem. Homestar Runner, uh, the brothers chaps are the ones that, that created him. Um, they were doing great back when Flash was a thing on the web because they would make these really cool interactive bits on the site, yeah. like every, every week or every month you could go up and there would be a new, a new thing. And there were some interactions that you could click and, and move around on. Uh, then sadly uh, their father passed away. And so they went into, you know, kind of a shutdown mode for several years and they have tried over the years to bring it back. They probably do like maybe one, maybe two new bits today, but because it's on YouTube, you don't have the fun clicky stuff and you don't get to explore around and see, you know, other takes and stuff. But Homestar Runner, I guess I would say, is absurdist in its humor. Uh, it was supposed to be a, a funny take on children's literature. You know, like, Homestar is a runner, and he's going to run. Run, Homestar Runner, run. run Homestar won he's the a, race. Hooray. He's a, he's a terrific athlete. Yes, he is a terrific athlete. Um, and so the, the absurd, the absurdity of that series had me cracking up so much that I even found the other day, Rodrigo, um, mm. they, are, they released a four DVD collection yeah. back in the, uh, it had to have been before 2006. 
Yeah. Um, they released a collection of all of their videos on DVD and I snatched those up and I forced my wife to watch these with me and she just thought it was the greatest thing. Um, sadly though, Homestar Runner is, I think a little harder to find. You can't find, or maybe you can find it on their Homestar Runner YouTube page, but I don't think you can find all of the original, um, bits out there they the, they've been uploading older things but oh, not but all surely. of the bits like okay. that that website was fully interactive right oh, yeah. so yeah. when you got when you went there you would get a menu and there was a randomized menu and different things would happen when you selected different parts of the menu right mm -hmm. that's mostly gone except because it's referenced in some of the cartoons you can see it i mean the site is still up i think but most people absorb these things through YouTube nowadays, which, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, it's interesting because you think as technology advances, uh, things would just get better and denser and you'd have more ability to do things, but it's actually a, a loss, right? The mm -hmm. interactability of Flash went away uh, and was uh, replaced by videos that, you know, the only thing you can do to interact in them is to click on like advertiser sites. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, pretty informative, uh, back in the early days. Uh, my wife's nickname came from one of the characters in the, mm -hmm. in the show, uh, strong, bad certainly, uh, has some impact today when I go to the mailbox, sure. uh, I'm like, instead of checking the email, it's like, check in the mail, check in the mail, check it, check it, check it, check it, check it, the mail. Uh, and my kids just look at me like, what the heck are you talking about? And I have yet to sit them down and have them watch Homestar Runner. But I think the youngest would probably get a big kick out of it. Yeah. So my number four, Homestar Runner. If you can find it, go watch it. Certainly the very early, early stuff is classic, classic comedy. All right, Rodrigo, what do you have for your number four? Uh, my number four is a movie. Um, it, uh, when I first saw it, I was sort of awestruck by it for two reasons one it's a horror comedy but it definitely pushes more towards the comedy aspect than say something like uh an american werewolf in london which technically could be considered a horror mm -hmm. comedy but i think it's mostly a horror movie um uh at one and two uh it really just aggressively hits you over the head with a sort of like uh, rhyme aspect. Basically, every scene that you see at the beginning of the movie gets warped in some way once the uh, zombie attack begins. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that movie, Shaun of the Dead. Um, Shaun of the Dead is hilarious in general, but also I think it's just a very well put together movie um it really kind of um like i said it th there's there's a lot of like you see this scene and then later on it's the same scene except it's been changed um by the zombie apocalypse things that characters mm -hmm. say at the beginning then the, and then when they say at the end the context has changed um it uh includes probably the best needle drop of a queen song <laughs> that I've heard, uh, that I've seen in a long time. Um, and, you know, again, if you're into who's in here that then has gone on to do other things or was doing other things, obviously Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, uh, Lucy Davis, if you saw the UK office, she's gone on to do other things. If you've seen the tick, uh, Amazon, the Amazon tick, Peter Serafinowicz is in this. Uh, so you got that going for you. Um, which is nice. So, yeah, my number, what are we on? Four. Four. Shun of the Dead. Very nice. All right, Matthew, what do you have for your number three? We are midway through this list. As we hit the midpoint, I feel like I've accidentally done one of those four movies to tell you who I am nonsenses. Because this is a movie that came out when I was 18, 1989's Heathers, one of the formative comedies uh, black comedies, but definitely formative comedies of my particular uh, life and or humor. Because it's the, I don't even know if it's a story so much. It's basically a relationship gone horribly wrong. 
Um, I don't know if it made Winona Ryder. It definitely made uh, the career of Christian Slater and features just a ton of, hey, it's that guy characters. Um, Virtually everybody in this movie, you're going to look at it and go, why do I know her? Where do I know her from? And she was probably in a scene of another teen movie being not quite as funny. And it's one of the few movies that can actually say that it ends with a 17-year-old exploding and having that be funny. Now, again, has not aged well. Uh, I feel like in a post-Columbine world, Heather's is just a monstrous, horrifying film. And definitely, if you've seen it and felt that and thought that, please note that as a huge, huge proponent of this movie and its humor, I definitely feel that. I definitely know that it's there. But boy, this is still a fun movie. It's a terrible movie. It is so over the top and the humor is just so very 90s and you know the year before the 90s began i guess technically it's sort of the er example of what would become the 90s if you've never seen heathers and you appreciate me and my humor i definitely recommend looking at heathers and seeing if it gives you kind of a new view into my head if you don't appreciate my humor sorry i mean i only talk for three or four minutes at a time and most importantly My number three on the list. If you put it together with the other four, you will probably not make me, but you'll find a person that people who know me find eerily familiar for some reason. All right. Uh, My number three, also a movie. Uh, There's a meme going around right now saying uh, something about, uh, uh, without saying Shrek, name your favorite Eddie Murphy movie, which I don't know why anybody would say Shrek is their favorite Eddie Murphy movie. Oh, because, because kids love Shrek, man. Oh, like, okay. I must have been too old, but anybody who is younger than me loves oh, Shrek. Shrek. They love it so much. And like, again, you have these like mini generations in between. Like some of them kind of love it ironically, but most of them don't. Most kids <laughs> love Shrek. And by kids, I mean people in their 30s and below. Wow. All right. Those, those are kids. Back in yeah, my day, totally back in my day, Eddie Murphy was on this thing called Saturday Night Live. That's where most of us discovered him. Or... If you uh, were able to get a copy of a copy of a copy of his uh, his comedy album that was circulating around the middle school, then by uh, by all accounts, you were an underage child waiting to get into the movies to see Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop, of course, is about a uh, uh, street smart uh, Alex Foley from the streets of Detroit detective who uh, is following up on a murder case. And it takes him to Beverly Hills, California, where he meets the uh, uptight police force there uh, headed by, well, not headed by, but featuring Judge Reinhold and Ronnie Cox and John Ashton. And they get into all sorts of hilarious adventures, including a giant shootout in a Beverly Hills mansion at the end of the movie. And uh, fish out of water movies uh, tend to do fairly well, I think. And when you've got somebody who is right on a comedic high that is Eddie Murphy by 1984. Uh, I, I think this perfectly encapsulates Eddie Murphy before, and I don't want to say sellout, but, but definitely is Eddie Murphy before he found out that, Oh, I just have to show up and say a few funny things and people give me money, uh, kind of things. This is a good movie. This is a really good movie. Uh, I don't think, I know a lot of people like Beverly Hills Cop 2 better. I don't. Uh, and hopefully nobody out there is like, no, I like Beverly Hills Cop 3. It's the best. Um, there's a three. Oh, yeah, there's mm-hmm. a three. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a three. Three is better than two, in my opinion. Oh, God. Oh, God. Why, 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 why? Which one, wait, which one's the one at the amusement park? Number three. Oh, that is three. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, Beverly Hills Cop is uh, still a classic today uh, because, you know, no one expects the banana in the in the tailpipe uh, routine. So uh, <laughs> my my number three, Beverly Hills Cop. There you go. All right, Rodrigo. Now on to your number three. My number three is another TV show. That also, like Happy Endings, uh, ended right at its like zenith of comedy. 
And I think that's part of the reason why I like to go back and revisit these shows is because they never had the opportunity to get stale. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's like, uh, although I've seen comedies that get stale right away, right, in the first season. So it's not just that. The writing's good, but also they didn't go off long enough to to overstay their welcome. I'm talking about Better Off Ted, a comedy that I've talked about before and one that... So this show came out in... 20, 2009, I think. 2009 to 2010. It is now 2024. And all of the jokes in it about uh, capitalism, the uncaringness, like how little a company cares about its employees, how, uh, how much the government... Uh, just steps aside if enough money is involved unfortunately continue to be extremely relevant like there are i watched an episode of roseanne recently and uh by choice no it was okay all right forgive um (laughs) so um in it everybody like Everybody's like real excited that they're and they're gonna go to the to the video store to rent some video, some VHSs, right? And it took me a while to realize because I wasn't paying super close attention to the beginning that this was an episode about them getting their first VCR, right? Mm, mm-hmm. That is a moment that um, has now been lost to time. Uh, there are people that remember that. There are people who were there when they first got their first VCR. But any new person that comes in, any younger person that comes in, is not going to relate to that unless they relate to it like sideways. Like, I remember when I first got my first next gen video game console, right? Or something like that. But it's not the same. It's just not the same thing. Better Off Ted just is completely relevant. Almost nothing about it, except maybe for like a few pop culture references here and there, just continues to be. Like, there's jokes about um, generating uh, meat, right? Like, creating meat that is not out of an animal. And then they realize that when the, if the meat is like sad, it tastes better. <laughs> um, or something like that. The, yeah, the, the joke yeah. is something like that. It's basically like engaging the meat as if, as it was, a, uh, you know, as if it did, was an animal makes it better. Um, there is a joke about how um, their system for keeping the lights on, right, for, like, their motion detectors uh, were not calibrated for black people. So if a black person is there by themselves in the office, the lights turn off on them. (laughs) So the fix, and the fix that the company comes up with at first is just so ridiculous but you think this could actually like i can see a company actually doing this especially as uh clowns like elon musk are like consistently in the news and they see themselves as these like visionary ceos right yeah one last thing that i'll point out uh there's an actress that she's not in every episode her name's carla jimenez um she was in uh raising hope Mm -hmm. also as a as not part of the main cast but uh, she's in raising hope and where she plays a maid which doesn't feel too bad because the the main mom character is also a maid uh she was also in the mick where she plays a maid but in better off ted she plays a scientist so there you go nice all right i remember you talking about that i i think i've watched a couple of episodes of of that show but then for whatever reason it slipped off my radar and i forgot to get back to it so I had I had the pleasure slash horrible experience of having worked for a Six Sigma company, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and it just like these jokes just like get to me <laughs> in my soul. Uh, Did they make you get the certification? No, no, no. I was just like I was a, a little peon. Only like management and above needed the certification. Yeah, I am Sigma Six certified, by the way. 
Oh, Ooh. nice. <laughs> pitchforks. People with pit pitchforks and torches are going to come to your house, Matthew. No, don't do it. That means he's unlocked his <laughs> psychic powers. <laughs> Hey, before we get into our top two, I just want to remind everybody that uh, if you enjoy this show, you find some humor in it, and you want to see it continue, then I would ask for you to join us over on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash major spoilers. That's where you can come and be like the fine patrons of the Renaissance period who saw and wanted to support the arts and great talent. And so they gave a little bit of their vast fortunes to the creators so that they could be entertained week after week with podcasts or who knows 16th uh, the 16th chapel or you know a statue of david or something who knows what they were doing but uh today you can support us for just a couple of bucks a month five bucks a month uh can keep this show going far into the future find out more at patreon.com slash major spoilers all right matthew what do you have for your number two I'm just trying to imagine what Michelangelo's podcast would be like. Hey, it's a me, um, a Michelangelo. The name of my show oh. is I'm a Smarter Than a You. <laughs> Shut hey, up, you call. knucklehead. If I recall my history, I'm pretty sure Michelangelo's podcast would have a rotating cast of, like, young, attractive men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, he would, that he would interview... And then probably never see again. Uh, yes, uh, young uh, Giuseppe, uh, you know that uh, I, I uh, have this uh, system where I go to sleep every six hours. Uh, would you like to uh, be part of this system oh, with me? Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, exactly. It will be right back. <laughs> All right, Matthew, what My do you have two. for your number two? Excellent. My number two is one of those movies that I appreciated and enjoyed when I saw it in my teens. Uh, but I gained a new appreciation for it when my kid saw it and loved it. And so over the last two or three years, I have probably seen Clue from 1985 at least a dozen times. Just watch it. If it's on, we watch it. And of course, you know, with the cable channels, it'll get into rotation. It'll stay there for a couple of months. But this movie is a revelation because everybody in the movie is an incredibly talented actor that you know from something. So there are actually only, I think, nine people in the movie, maybe ten, uh, if you don't count the moment where occasionally, you know, police will show up. But the movie Clue is based on the board game Clue, which apparently is known as Cluedo for people who are not in the continental United States. So the movie may be known as Cluedo there. And the movie was released originally with three different endings, and I believe there was some sort of contest to figure out which was the correct one. And the winner, I don't know, got like um, an air conditioner or something. But when you sit down and you watch this movie, it is just a master class in watching comedians play their character perfectly well. Tim Curry plays the butler and just this amazing cast. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, who is, of course, Doc Brown. Michael McKeon, who's Lenny from uh, Laverne and Shirley. Martin Mull, who's just funny in everything. Eileen Brennan, Leslie Ann Warren. Uh, it stars both the lead singer of the Go-Go's and the lead singer of the punk band Fear, which uh, probably none of you have heard of, but they were the ones who were on Saturday Night Live one time, and their bassist hit himself in the face with his bass and then bled for the second entire performance, and it was just a whole thing. But I'm not going to tell you what happens in the movie, but if you know the game Clue, you know that somebody dies, and you know that there's murder weapons, and you have to figure it out. So if you have not seen my number two, remember that it's one plus two plus one plus one, and not one plus two plus two plus one. And even if it were, it would be one plus two plus one plus one, not one plus one plus two plus one. And if you understood any of that, then definitely go and watch Clue right now. It's probably on cable, like literally airing somewhere live where you are. Just go look for it. All right. Uh, for my number two, television. I've done an audio bit. I've done a web bit. I've done a movie bit. Now it's time for a television bit. And in the 90s, this was part of, I think, pretty much all throughout the 90s. Uh, this was part of the must-see TV where everybody would stop what they were doing on a Thursday night and watch Seinfeld and then, uh, and then uh, stand around the water cooler the next day talking about it. I think the end of Seinfeld probably kind of marked the end of the monoculture uh, 
just because of of how influential it was on the landscape of things. But, uh, you know, it's a great show, great lines, uh, great bits. Even today, people are still quoting uh, Seinfeld and the show's been off the air for 20 years, something like that, 25 years. Uh, So if you've never seen an episode of Seinfeld, even my kids have seen Seinfeld. Uh, The oldest boy went through a binge when it was, what was it, on Netflix the last time before it moved over to wherever it's at now. Uh, and just watched every single episode and was like, yeah, this is a pretty funny show. I can see why why your generation liked it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thanks a lot there, kid. But uh, Seinfeld, it's a show about nothing, but it sure had a lot of laughs. Uh, so there you go. That's my number two. Rodrigo, what do you have for your number two? My number two is another movie. Um, it's one that I like to revisit frequently, although I think I've kind of slipped and haven't seen it in probably three years now. Um, and that's so brother where art thou? Oh yeah. Ooh. So I, uh, really like musicals. I don't like every musical, right? It's not like if something's a musical, I like it better. Um, but I like, uh, movies that are musicals. Um, Oh brother, where art thou has a lot of like diegetic music. Mm-hmm which is fun. It's also like, you know, old timey bluegrassy music. So it's interesting. It's not the type of soundtrack that you might be used to with a lot of Hollywood movies. Um, but it's good times. It uh, also, again, star studded cast, right? George Clooney, uh, Tim Blake Nelson, who I think since then has become a lot bigger than he was mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. But, you know, Holly Hunter, John Goodman, John Turturro, uh, like very very strong character actors, Charles Durning. Um, yep, uh, Papi O'Daniel, and um, the devil. The devil is also in it, mm-hmm. which is which is which brings me to my next thing. Not only is it a musical comedy, but it's set in a particular time in a particular place, and they gave it at least two real characters. Right, uh, one of them is Tommy Johnson. Tommy mm-hmm. Johnson is in this, like legendary blues musician Tommy Johnson, mm-hmm. and all, and Babyface Nelson, legendary bank robber Babyface Nelson. Right? They are mm-hmm. like these are just characters that uh, our band of escapees run into uh, multiple times. Actually, Tommy kind of sticks with them for a little while, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, it's hilarious. I think a lot of people don't realize that those are real people, um, so. Go, you can go read up on them and then go back and watch Oh Brother, Where Art Thou and get a kick out of that. It's also, on top of everything else, it's supposedly based on the Odyssey, very loosely based on the Odyssey. Um, <laughs> when I first saw it, I was actually annoyed because I had read the Odyssey. This was a very long time ago. And I was like, this is like barely anything like the book. Right? And it's like, it took me a while to be like, okay, well, they, it's like, it's not actually based on the Odyssey. It's like very broadly, like these are a few of the themes of the Odyssey to spice up our Southern hillbilly musical extravaganza. Uh, good times. Check yeah. it out. Yeah, very good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our number one. Matthew, what do you have for your number one comedy? I am almost certain that this will come as no surprise to anyone who knows me, but my number one comedy, and again, I went with all film, is 1994's Clerks. Mm -hmm. If I had to pick a single film, which I quote more than any, it would be Clerks. And that that is a high bar. I mean, you, you can say, everybody can say that, but I quote movies without realizing I'm quoting movies. And the movie Clerks is just like ingrained into my very DNA. And I will, I will say this. I want to, I want to make this clear. I've seen Clerks three. I do not forgive Kevin Smith for Clerks three. And I feel like Kevin Smith is one of those filmmakers who much like me believes that a dead horse is never completely dead until you really, really hit it a few times to make sure that it's dead. And so I feel like Kevin definitely goes back to the well, maybe even more than I would choose to. But, you know, it's it's a choice that he's made. It's a thing that he does. But in Clerks, you're kind of looking at like a 26-year-old filmmaker scraping together money to tell what is essentially 
his story. It's a story of a bunch of guys, a couple of guys actually, who work in a convenience store and some of the interactions that they have. As the view is universe, which grows out of Clerks goes on, it becomes clear that this day is the only interesting day that Dante and Randall ever had. And for the next 45 million years, they're going to be talking about this one day that happened to the movie Clerks. But if you just sit down and kind of watch it, and even if you watch it with the expectation of, I am now going to, I don't know, maybe drink the very blood of the DNA of the Generation X, I feel like Clerks will definitely still hold up. And the probably the best part about it is that there are no professional actors in it, really. There are no professional filmmakers. There are moments where you're like, why did he cut away to that shot? And the answer is because when he was producing the film, he burned the, the film and had to have a cutaway to hide the fact that he screwed up. But if you just sit down and you watch it, it's kind of like the movie equivalent of garage rock, like an album that somebody made with their cousin in their basement. And I've always loved that. And I love a movie that, you know, opens with just this endless dull drudgery of not necessarily my meaningless uh, brainless job, but a meaningless brainless job. And anybody who's ever answered a phone or delivered a paper or gone door to door or done telemarketing or stood behind a counter, you'll feel this movie. You'll feel it in your gut. You'll feel it in your bones. You might even hate it. And that's why you'll love it. My number one movie, Clerks. All right. My number one is audio, is a video game, is a movie, is a television. It's all of these things that I've kind of talked about before. Well, not web, but we'll say video game. And uh, it works in every incarnation. In fact, every incarnation that this uh, comedy has uh, taken part in is slightly different. Still same, same, same <laughs> theme, still same uh, plot points, but oftentimes just a little something added to it to make it completely different. And listen, I know it's 2024 and we are looking outside every morning and we're like, oh my God, it's the worst, worst day ever. Well, you're not Arthur Dent. Not only <laughs> is he waking up and finding that his house is being torn down to make way for a bypass, his whole planet, planet Earth, our planet, gets destroyed to make way for a hyperspace bypass. And so thanks to his good friend Ford Prefect, the two of them go flying through the galaxy on adventures as Ford tries to complete his entry for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the guide that everyone needs as they travel the universe. Uh, Douglas Adams will be missed, but uh, man, every incarnation of this, of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is always a treat to explore and uh, always reminds you that you should uh, always know where your towel is. So that is my number one, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the galaxy. Rodrigo, what do you have for your number one? My number one is um, uh, a movie and a play um, that uh, I've, I've always liked it. I first saw it as, the, as, as a movie um, when I was in high school and it really stuck with me and I kind of didn't see it again for years, but I thought about it a lot. Um, and when I started watching it again, I noticed a lot more things about it, a lot more things I liked. Uh, as it turns out, I married someone who's a huge fan of it. So I have since gone and seen live performances of Little Shop of Horrors. Um, and it is hilarious. It's really funny. Um, it is an another... Uh, another piece of media that that continues to be sort of uh, aggravatingly relatable and current. Um, uh, it's like obviously it's like a big wacky comedy with a giant plant puppet, but what the characters are feeling, where the characters come from, what the characters will do for success, uh, feels like it could have been written today, mm -hmm. or you know, or recently at least. Um, you just, you know, if you're a kid, you just got to look up what Skid Row is. But once you do, you, you know what they're talking about. Uh, the name for Skid Row changes, but Skid Row doesn't change. Uh, if you like the movie, 
uh, the there's two movies. One that is not a musical, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one that was created after it was turned into a musical. I would say watch the musical. The musical has great songs. Um, the original movie I've seen once a long time ago. And I don't, I don't, I just don't think it's as good, but you know, Jack Nicholson's in it. Yeah. Um, the in one. the, the movie that I think most people have seen and the most accessible way of watching this, uh, you know, again, lots of fun people are in it. Rick Moranis, Steve Martin, um, Jim Belushi's in it. Bill Murray's in it. The, although those last two briefly, same thing with John Candy. Um, mm-hmm. It like interestingly, um, something that you might not think about necessarily going in when you look at like pictures of the cast is like, oh yeah, here's like you know Ellen Green and Rick Moranis and stuff, and these are the um, main characters. But this is actually kind of a who's who for like '90s, um, '90s black women in comedy. Like mm-hmm. Tashina Arnold is in this. Tisha Campbell is in this. Um, Michelle Weeks also. Um, so the uh the chorus like the greek chorus in it is uh also went on to do like really good things um it features incredible puppetry frank oz i believe was uh in charge of it and inside the plant a lot of the time uh it also features really good camera trick special effects um you know when the vine wraps wraps it wraps itself around something if you if you really look you can tell that like the film is reverse right it's like they wrap the vine around something oh, yeah, and then yeah. pulled it loose pulled it, yeah um and of course uh some of the songs were too fast for the puppet so they uh you just couldn't move its mouth up and down and operate the lips fast enough so they slowed it down so if you pay really close attention you can see Rick Moranis singing at about like uh, mm-hmm. half time um, along with the plant. But when you speed it all up, it all works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's really good. Uh, the one thing that you don't get with the movie is the quote unquote alternate ending, which was the original ending in which the plants win. Um, but uh, if you go online, you can track down the. Um, the movie version of that, which I think is like just a storyboard and a few, um, a few actual shots that were shot, um, along with their recording of it. But anytime you go watch it live, I think that's the only ending that live productions do. So if you did get a chance to watch it live, you get to watch a different ending to Little Shop of Horrors. There you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our top five comedies. It's quite a list. Some of them you've probably seen or heard or read or, or viewed in some way, shape, or form. Maybe some of them are new to you. Maybe you disagree with some of the things that are on our list. That's okay, too. Here's what you can do. You can head over to the Major Spoilers Discord server. It's free to join. There's a link in the show notes. Again, in this day and age, how many things do you get that are free with no strings attached? All you got to do is join the Discord server for free. You can go over there and join a growing group of awesome people, hang out, chat about different things. But we do have different channels, including the Top 5 channel, where you can go in and share your Top 5 comedies. Other people will share their Top 5 comedies, and you'll read their list, and they'll read your list. Why? Because everybody loves a list. This podcast is copyright 2024 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.